and thank you um, for inviting me here today. Thank the staff and, uh, and pupils at Stockwell High School for that invitation. I was so impressed by uh, those four pupils from the school and the, uh, their uh, clear passion for reading and the way they crafted uh, what they said to us today. Uh, as many uh, will know, today is the 200th, 200th anniversary of the birth of one of the great modern novelists, Charles Dickens. Dickens was an author who himself read voraciously, and he would be delighted to, to know that his books are still being read and reread and shared and enjoyed and annotated until their pages yellow uh, today. The great irony, of course, is that when Dickens was writing, a few were actually reading. Fewer than half of children attended early Victorian schools. The Industrial Revolution brought terrible poverty and hardship, and literacy uh, was a gift for the few. Today, almost everyone reads and writes. We blog, we tweet, we report, comment, email, and update to an, an astonishing extent. The chief executive of Google, Eric uh, Schmidt, uh, estimated that we create as much information every two days on the internet as was produced in the entire history of mankind up until 2003. But even after two centuries, of technological and social revolution, there are still shadows of Dickens's world in our own, with lit literacy problems remaining asymmetric and heavily orientated towards the poorest in our communities. 60% of white boys eligible for free school meals are not reading properly at the age of 14. Only 73% of pupils on free school meals, and only two thirds of boys eligible for free school meals achieve the expected standard of Key Stage 1. We need, if you'll forgive the Dickens pun, much greater expectations of children in reading. And this is why the government is absolutely determined <coughs> excuse me, to help all children from all backgrounds to become fluent and enthusiastic readers. We already know how to tackle reading failure from the youngest ages. High quality international evidence has demonstrated that the systematic teaching of synthetic phonics is the best way of making sure young children acquire the crucial skills they need to read new words, so driving up standards in reading. Children are taught the sounds of the alphabet and how to blend those sounds into words. And taught as part of a language-rich curriculum, systematic synthetic phonics allows problems to be identified early and rectified before it's too late. And it's a pleasure to see uh, Jennifer Chu in the audience, who's done so much with the Reading Reform Foundation to promote this agenda, and of course, uh, Chris Jolly, whose name is synonymous with phonics. And I see also Sir Jim Rose, whose seminal report uh, was crucial in ensuring that we have phonics in all our schools. We've already introduced a number of measures to ensure that more young children learn the essential skill of decoding and to equip schools with the necessary skills, resources, and training. We've reviewed the qualified teacher status standards, so it's now a requirement that teachers of early reading should demonstrate a clear understanding of the theory and teaching of systematic synthetic phonics. And from this summer, the new Year One phonic screening check will support teachers to confirm whether individual pupils have grasped fundamental phonic decoding skills and identify which children may need extra help. And I'm delighted to see that 4,000, over 4,000 primary schools have already signed up to spend more than 10 million pounds on new phonics products and training, taking advantage of the government's match funding scheme to buy a range of teaching resources, uh, training uh, books and software. But there are still too many areas, including perversely, those with some of the most pressing literacy problems who are not taking advantage of this invitation, despite all the national and international evidence in support of urgent action. The Centre for Social Justice has identified literacy and numeracy problems in 60% of children in schools that specialise in helping those with behavioural problems, and in 50 to 60% of the prison population. The CBI last year surveyed 500 employers and found that 42% were dissatisfied with school leavers' use of English, while at the end of last year, army recruiting officers revealed that hundreds of would-be soldiers are being turned away 
because they cannot pass the most basic literacy and numeracy tests. That is because they have a reading age of less than an 11 year old. The net result? We've tumbled down the world rankings for literacy from 7th to 25th, and the reading ability of GCSE pupils in England is now more than a year behind the standards of their peers in Shanghai, Korea, and Finland, and at least six months uh, behind those in Hong Kong, Singapore, Canada, New Zealand, Japan, and Australia. In the words of the US Education Secretary, Arne Duncan, we are being out-educated by some of these nations. And it's become abundantly clear that we need to think long and hard about whether the expected levels of reading we demanded in the past are still good enough. An 11-year-old reading at the expected level will be able to read fluently and understand the story well. But so many children can exceed these modest expectations if supported properly, as we saw this morning uh, with the four youngsters who presented to us. Last week, I visited Thomas Jones Primary School in Ladbroke Grove where despite the fact that almost two-thirds of the pupils don't have English as a first language, and more than half are on free school meals, the children there at that primary school <coughs> are reading and enjoying Shakespeare's sonnets. And quite remarkably, all of its 11-year-olds, all of them, read to the expected level, level four, and 60% surpass it and are reaching level five, well above the London average of 43%, or the national average of 29%. The national picture on literacy is more mixed. In 2011, four out of five 11-year-olds achieved what we expect in reading, which is a marginal improvement on where we were 10 years ago. But the number of pupils attaining the highest standard in reading and writing has stalled dramatically. 10 years ago, the percentage of pupils achieving the highest levels, level five or over, was 29%. And in 2011, it was still 29%. On the Key Stage 2 reading test, 41,000 pupils achieved only a level 2 or below. That's four years behind the expected standard. And the problem is even more marked for boys, with almost twice as many boys than girls getting a level 2 at best. The challenge for schools today is to be more ambitious. Ask whether the expected level is actually good enough. Surely we have to look at this as a minimum expected because when business leaders like John Cridland say that 42% of school leavers have poor literacy, we can't pretend we don't have a problem or pretend that the expected level is good enough. We need to raise our sights beyond okay. By the end of primary school, we want children to be able to read fluently, to interpret a book's meaning, and be able to read more complex books by the likes of Morpurgo, Wilson, and Dahl. Every young person, should have read at least one Dickens novel by the end of their teenage years. I most emphatically, emphatically do not, however, want to give the impression that reading is valuable only in the utilitarian sense of getting a job or passing a test. Quite the opposite. Once young people learn to read, they should read because it's enjoyable and a good thing in its own right. As a boy, I took to books because I was inspired to do so by the imagination of authors like C.S. Lewis, Arthur Conan Doyle, and C.S. Forrester, as well as, of course, Enid Blyton and Agatha Christie, who doesn't love a good murder mystery. As an adult, nothing gives me greater pleasure than visiting a school like Stockwell Park High School and listening to students uh, talking with real passion about their own favorite books, as I did next door before coming uh, here to take part in this discussion. And, the, uh, and what we heard last, next door was all those children that I, I met, were and I think they sitting at the back, are uh, reading every day at home for half an hour at least, 45 minutes at least, and they have a real passion for reading, which is what we want. But according to the OECD, uh, the UK is ranked a lowly 47th out of 65 nations on the number of young people who read for enjoyment. Only 60% of teenagers regularly read for pleasure in this country, compared to 90% in some other countries. One could argue that young people have many competing and important demands on their time with the attractions of social media, television, games, consoles, and smartphones. But it's gravely concerning to see this country's young people falling out of love with reading 
especially when literature still has such a unique and irreplaceable part to play in our lives. As Mark Haddon said, lay the novel alongside film and its specialness becomes obvious. Film promises everything, but it can't do smell or taste or texture. It can't tell us what it's like to inhabit a human body. It can't show how you and I look at the same face and see two different people. Jeanette Winterson makes a similar point, saying, we need a language capable of simple, beautiful expression, yet containing complex thought that yields up our feelings instead of depriving us of them. You only get that kind of possibility through reading at a high level. And that's why young people should sometimes actively choose a book over the TV or games consoles. Literature reveals something to us all about ourselves. It teaches us about the world we inhabit, about relationships, about danger and loss. Uniquely, it also allows us to experience what it is like to be someone else, to share their concerns, their foibles and their differences. And ever since man developed the capacity to speak, the ability to create fictions and enjoy them, as J.P. Davidson writes, has created an otherness from our consciousness that binds us together as social animals. Literature and language is, quite simply, profoundly important in understanding our world as a shared experience. The big worry, however, is that more and more young people are missing out on this experience. The National Literacy Trust, it's good to see Jonathan Douglas here, uh, released research recently that shows that only one in three children actually own a book. Yet we know that the difference in reading ability between pupils who never read for enjoyment and those who read for just half an hour a day is equivalent to a year's schooling by the age of 15. And whenever I make that point, incidentally, to primary school pupils, I always get a sharp intake of breath by the students. Who go, is that really true? And it is. Unfortunately, even when young people do wish to read, the exam system doesn't encourage them. The curriculum suggests authors from Pope to Trollope and Tennyson, but the English Literature GCSE only actually requires students to study four or five texts, including one novel. In exams, more than 90% of the answers on novels are on the same three works, of Mice and Men, Lord of the Flies, and To Kill a Mockingbird. All wonderful books, no question about that. But in fact, out of more than 300,000 students who took one exam board's paper last year, just 1,700 studied a novel from before the 20th century. Just 1,236 read Pride and Prejudice, 285 Far From the Madding Crowd, and 187 read Wuthering Heights. And this is why the government is taking action to encourage wider reading through the national reading competition that we've launched today. The competition starts in September and is aimed at seven to 12 year old pupils right across the country with the ultimate goal to support thousands more children and young people to read for pleasure. It's also why we're keen to champion and support the tremendous work already happening on the ground through programs like uh, National Reading Week and the 50 Book Challenge. Government can only do so much to encourage the love of reading. Nothing kills passion like bureaucracy, but it is important for us to mix practical support with recognition of the tremendous efforts of others, including the work that Viv Bird and her team are doing at Book Trust with the backing of, of generous publishers through programs such as uh, the Letterbox Club. And likewise, I'm a huge admirer of the Reading Agency's Summer Reading Challenge, which persuaded 760,000 children to pick up books over the summer. And the National Literary Trust's a Premier League Reading Stars campaign for encouraging so many younger children to read. And it was good to be at the Emirates Stadium last week uh, where uh, Thea Walcott was championing this programme. And I think nothing will do more to encourage boys in particular to read than to see Theo Walcott, himself an author, by the way, of children's books, uh, as an example and a role model to, uh, uh, for reading. And I'd encourage everyone to support both World Book Day, which celebrates its 15th year this year, and the inspirational World Book Night with its thousands of volunteer book givers. And finally, we must pay thanks to the authors themselves, whose creativity and talent propels children and young people into reading. 
this country has some of the best authors of child, teen, and adult fiction in the world. But while names like Blackman and Haddon are all rightly celebrated, too many pupils are growing up unable to enjoy them. And just as the wonderful characters of Dickens, like my favorite, Mr. Pickwick, or Sam Weller, or Micawber, or Uriah Heep, Oliver Twist, and Scrooge, were lost on many of his own generation of young people, so characters like Callum and Sefi, Chris and Nobody Owens, uh, will be lost on ours unless we take action. The government is determined to change what we expect of young people and schools that teach them. Great expectations may have come to Philip Pirrip, but it's high expectations that we need for every child in the country, regardless of background or ability. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.